this session about a little bit about data and the state, which is the field that I mostly work on. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, who or what? I want to tell you a little bit why, who am I and where I work for, because maybe most of you don't know it. I work for Fundar. It's an Argentine think tank, like an, a, an NGO, where we try to mostly work to do academic research and advocacy for public policies. I mean, we try to, for example, uh, research in fields that we, we are interested in, economics, natural resources, justice, data also, artificial, artificial intelligence, and to give recommendations to governments. So governments can do policies based on evidence and don't, don't do policies based on, for example, what the politician feels like or likes the most. So uh, we, we are from Argentina, in case we are really low in the map, but we are uh, in Buenos Aires, and I'm from the data team. The data team is kind of unique, uh, because no, no other think tanks have a lot of data teams. We have, for example, physicists, uh, sociologists, economists, such as me, and also uh, computer systems also, of course. So I am Paula, and just so you know, I am a researcher at Fundar. I, am, I studied economics, but then I, I changed, like switched paths, and started uh, doing a master in data science. So at Fundar, like, we have three missions. We like to think that our work is established in these three missions. We aim to uh, develop Argentina. As many of you might know, of course, uh, the region has a lot of trouble, but Argentina has also unique travels to develop and to grow. So we think that there are three main things that Argentina needs to do in order to grow, such as generate wealth, to promote welfare, and also to transform the state. And this is a very important uh, thing for us because at Fundar, at the data team, we're very interested in transforming the state. The state, the Argentinian state, particularly the government, is not quite efficient. Uh, doesn't provide all the time very good public services, or at least it could improve them. So we think that it is crucial to transform the state and to introduce new techniques to make decisions. So in this, like, this is kind of the scope, so you know wh why am I talking about this. Uh, the data team at Fundar, we think that we need to create a smart state. We like to, co to call it a smart state, just to put a fancy name. And the smart state makes decisions based on evidence. And for example, it does two things, like exploits new data sources, like it doesn't only use traditional service, it also uses, for example, uh, satellite images or ge ge uh, geographical references, and also, for example, big data. And also, it incorporates new techniques. I mean, not only artificial intelligence, like. LLM models, but also new statistical techniques that the government is not using uh, yet. So we think that we are in some, I mean, it's very like, it's, it's not a, there are a myriad of realities in the Argentinian government, but we're a little far away from that. So today I wanted to tell you about two examples that were right, uh, that Fundar, like we work with, uh, with the government and it had successful results in terms of using and making new and improved policies. So these two examples, uh, and I'm going to check, okay. Um, these two examples are some works that we did with go the government, the national government of Argentina. The first one is with the Ministry of Culture. Uh, a couple of years ago, I think, well, it was 2021, the Ministry of Culture in the midst of the pandemic created a registry the Federal Registry of Culture, where cultural workers were, could enroll and, for example, apply for grants, apply for uh, some other uh, scholarships that the ministry had, and some other, for example, subsidies. This, this is an administrative record. It's an online website where people uh, could cre create a profile and say, okay, I'm a craftsman, I'm a musician, I work in visual arts, etc." So the ministry got a 100,000 records, a big database, but like they didn't plan to use it for, I don't know, uh, analyzing it. So that's when we like joined forces and we suggested them, okay, you have information about a lot of people. 
not only about what they do, where they live, what their, where their income comes from. I mean, do they live because of that cultural activity or not? So with that, we thought, okay, why don't we do some unsupervised learning? And I don't know, put a, an algorithm that says something about the data. So with that, we thought, okay, let's create this, uh, this tool to make public policy. So we just suggested to do clustering because they had information about a lot of people and they didn't know, I mean, it's, it's not easy to, and also they had, and what is really important, and I didn't mention it, they could have information about other government data sources, such as, for example, the registry. In Argentina, you can be like formally employed or you can be an independent worker. So they had this valuable information and we thought, okay, why don't you do a clustering so to discover groups? I mean, are there different profiles in the data or not? I mean, some tool to help them, for example, analyze those records, not to do just a chart, a line chart, but to analyze it. So we chose clustering for these reasons because it helped, the, it helped them to discover patterns in data that they didn't find before and also to find groups and different profiles. And that's, I mean, it also came because of a concern of the ministry. It's not just that we proposed this. Like they were interested in doing some target policies in a context where the budget of the ministry of the whole government is not so, uh, it's kind of tight. So they didn't have much to do, uh, they didn't have much budget to do things. So they, they said, okay, let's do a target policy in a specific group. And of course, it was also useful to later evaluate. I mean, did it work in this group or did it work better in the other? So with this, we, uh, we did this, I mean, we use, uh, we chose, for those that might know, clustering is like putting an algorithm where you don't put a lot of, I mean, you don't have to set many things, like the alg algorithm will look at per patterns in the data and separate the groups. So we chose, the, uh, we tried with different algorithms like partitional ones, hierarchical um, and spectral ones, and we chose a very easy and common clustering technique, which is K-modes, that worked fine because our data was categorical. Like we didn't have much numbers, we had more categories. So for example, we found six clusters, and this is one of the variables that we had, which is the percentage of income that people earn from their cultural activity. So for example, cluster one, it says does, don't answer because most of the people from cluster one didn't have any income from the cultural activity because they were unemployed in that cluster. And also, of course, there were others where, like cluster two and three, mostly lived of that. I mean, the work they do in the culture, yeah, they use it to live. And cluster four, which had, they work of, of cultural activities, but they earned very little of that. So why is it useful? And to give like the highlight of this case, is because this helped them, for example, to find the most vulnerable cluster, which was the fourth one, which was a cluster of about 18% of the 100,000 records. Uh, the majority of, le of them lived in Buenos Aires, and 82% of them were women. And also, they were informal workers of low income. So they found like this specific population where they could do a targeted policy. Like, for example, do or uh, some grants or some I don't know, um, special activities for women living there and who also, for example, work in visual arts mostly. So this was, this was really helpful because like now they didn't have to do a policy for the 100,000, they could target them and they could help them the most since they were the most vulnerable, vulnerable ones. So this is the first case, uh, like, well, so our, uh, unsupervised learning uh, for data policy. And now this one uh, is, is not about artificial intelligence, but it is about the use of big data uh, for public, po public, public policy. So also in 2021, the, the, some, the Ministry of Tourism and Sports, it had like a special agency to promote tourism that bought a big, da a big database of um, cell phones activities, like uh, with an identifier of cell phones, I mean, not the cell phone, an anonymous identifier, 
and the location of where they went. So the ministry like tried to, okay, how can we process this? So it is something useful for us and it has some insights for us. So what they did also, this was a joint work with the ministry and with a special lab from the University of Buenos Aires that provided like the, the infrastructure because the database was really big and no one could process it but them. So we also work with the university. And for example, this da database had, it had more uh, records, but after some cleaning process, we got 30 million records of IFA. Those IFA are uh, anonymous users identifiers that are used mostly for uh, digital marketing and all that kind of campaigns. So we got like a lot of records and also we could identify, okay, where the people, the person lived in, in the term of, uh, well, in Argentina it's called Radio Sensal, which is like a big place where uh, the census usually takes place. So we could identify where they live in terms of that measure and we could see if they traveled somewhere and how they get there, which is something that improved the information the ministry had. Like the ministry had traditional service where people was asked, okay, where are you going to? I'm going to Bariloche. And like we, you knew maybe who they traveled with and if by car or by plane, but they didn't know like if they went by car, where, what route did they used to go? Did they stop? Like did they go to Bariloche, but also they stop in the middle and I don't know, visited Las Grutas? Like those kind of questions weren't uh, able to be answered with traditional service and the, they are able to be answered with this kind of source. Because we know like every step of the way. And for example, like a highlight, there's a, the pro Argentinian province, La Pampa, like in the traditional service, no one went to La Pampa or very, <laughs> very few people. But in this, uh, using this methodology, a lot of people went to La Pampa because they use it to travel to Patagonia. So it was, it's like a more faithful picture in some terms than the traditional survey. Uh, and also, and the last important thing is that like 40% of the population that was in this database wasn't in the survey because surveys are usually run for big cities, not for small ones. So in this survey, we have like everyone and it's the 40% of the population, which is not uh, little. And just to wrap up and to, well, to tell you a little bit about how the ministry used this to, I don't know, to do some politics and insights. It really used them to do, uh, ah, I'm sorry, and this is the QR. It's because there's a document, if you want to scan it, about this whole case. They use it to um, identify visitors to nat national parks because the ministry had an important policy of natural destinations. And for example, they could identify, okay, the National Park of Iguazú, where the Iguazú Falls are, where, do, where does people come from? Do they come from, uh, for example, the same province, Misiones? Do they come from Buenos Aires? Do they come from Córdoba? Where? And also, by matching this source with the census, which was, was something they, we did, we identified, okay, where, what, what is the, the socioeconomic status they have? Like, do they come from the NSE, which is like the most, uh, the richest people of the population, or do they come from the poorest people of the population? So this was important because of this, because it, it gave insight about the people that visited the park and also about, okay, maybe some people from some province is not going because there are no routes or the route is bad or the route doesn't have facilities. Well, with this, we could identify it. And well, these are the two cases. I think, I hope you understood, understood something of it. Um, and also just to, come, just to tell you, there are more cases to come. Like we are launching a document soon with a successful cases. Six more cases are going to come. So if you want to, I don't know, check Fundar's, uh, her, there you have like my contact details and also Fundar, so you can follow, follow us and well, check <laughs> for updates. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, that's better. Okay, questions. I have a question about the first case you presented. Um, 
did you consider using like a, a model, a linear model or something like that to understand which variables are the most, like that impact on, on people uh, earning a living from, from art or something like that, instead of like an unsupervised model? Yeah, like um, running like a linear model or something like that to understand which variables is more important to, you know, how much people make. Yeah, linear model, yeah. Yeah, actually, we didn't do that, uh, but it was a good point. No, we didn't do that. I mean, we just, we did some, we mostly did descriptive analysis and also tried, because what they asked was to segment for profiles. So we tried with, for example, K-modes, but also with other supervised techniques like trees or something to identify the most important variables. And after we had identified like what are the variables that are dividing people, then we use the clustering. So we didn't use a linear one, but we like try for different things to find. We also did like the correlation, the categorical correlation with variables. So we did that to identify it. Anyone else? No. Gracias, Paula. Buenísimo. Tengo una pregunta. ¿Cómo fue el proceso con, de acceso a, las, a los dos registros? O sea, sobre todo me, me aprecia el de, la, el de cultura, porque hay mucho dato personal. Entonces, ¿cómo fue el tratamiento incluso para poder trabajar con esos datos de forma segura? O si estaban anonimizados, ¿cómo fue? Ah, Respondo en español. No sé si... Um, igual le puedo decir dos veces. Estaban anonimizados, inclusive nosotros los ayudamos a anonimizarlo, o sea, con algunas técnicas de, de hashing, etcétera, y nos lo, nos lo compartieron anonimizado. O sea, solo sacaron todos datos personales y algunos los encriptaron. Y lo de turismo, eso, o sea, estaba así. Sí, ya está así. So, yes, it was anonym anonymized, like with some hashing techniques and removing personal data, and also, We signed like a confidential agreement, of course, because we know that some, like with a lot of granularity, you could identify people. So we signed an agreement uh, not to do that. <laughs> 